So, Kolya, how, um, how did you become a mathematician? Well, first I think I became a theoretical physicist. And then mathematical structures in theoretical physics became more and more interesting to me. And so the emphasis shifted to structures rather than to objects of study. And this is when I felt that I became a mathematician. So you, when you started going to university, you wanted to be a physicist rather than... You know. Well, I didn't know whom I wanted to be and him whom I will be. The future is in the clouds. But uh, definitely physics and mathematics was interesting to me. But it, it has always been a, on, a, on a theoretical level uh, in terms of physics, isn't it? Yes. Not, it is not, it's not the I should say that experimental physics was always a big problem to me. I had to do some labs and I had nightmares about it for several years. <laughs> Russia was very efficient at producing good mathematics. Uh, good mathematicians, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, a lot of them uh, moved into the West, and now you can't, f almost can't find a mathematical institute uh, without, a, with a, without a, a Russian professor there. Um, do you have any reason uh, to why this Russia was so good at producing mathematicians? Well, subjectively, I faced the environment where um, Science and mathematics uh, were really praised as something very valuable in the society. And so as a young man, you, you have certain values in the society and you're trying to follow them. And I think I was somewhat indoctrinated by this <laughs> from early on. So uh, that's one reason. Uh, the kind of technical reason for why there are so many Russian former Soviets, some of them mathematicians uh, around the world, um, is uh, because it was really a very strong school. And uh, I, we had fantastic teachers, and I should say that I really appreciate and I'm really lucky to, to have them. Um, there was a, I think there was also a political reason why theoretical sciences were so strong theoretical sciences, not political sciences, because really it's in the Soviet society there was not much freedom of in anything else. So that was the freedom enclave where naturally sort of the kind of curious minds would fall in. I think that was the main reason. Do you remember the first time you proved the theorem? What what feeling did you what feeling did you feel? Yeah, I remember. It was, uh, I'll not tell you the details how it happened, but I remember the feeling of clarity. That's probably the... Uh, clarity and easiness and surprise that it was so easy. And, and, and I guess this must come from going around in the dark for a long time and then... Yeah, the, uh, exactly. The, uh, it was... I was in the dark for a couple of weeks before. Maybe three weeks. Maybe more, I don't remember. How do you then find your inspiration to, to attacking uh, certain problems? Uh, do you sit around alone in your room or do you collaborate with uh, other people? Or, or how, do you, how do you approach research? Yeah, I think both. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's, if you sit for long for too long, somehow you may have a kind of tendency to stagnate. Um, or maybe, yeah, probably stagnate. Uh, if you talk with people too much, I mean, you don't have time to think and you so don't go deeper. So I think it's a, it's a combination of both and it's very individual uh, what exactly they... Yeah, but what works, which way works for you? It's hard to say. Um, I do both, definitely. If you think about a single piece of, of mathematics that you, that you really enjoy, uh, what would that be? Do I really enjoy a single piece? I can imagine the equivalence class of uh, mathematical problems that I really enjoy. 
and this is the equivalence class of problems that I really enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there are several but of if them. If you should pick <laughs> one representative of this, uh, uh, this class, what should it be? Uh, well, one representative, uh, say, I, when I was learning, uh, say, the classification of simple Lie groups, and uh, that was really fascinating. The root systems, I mean, there is such a rigid structure in sort of, um, actually, probability theory is really interesting subject. It's, uh, I enjoy it. Whatever I, little I know about it, I enjoy learning. So mathematics is often guided by problems and, and conjectures. Um, so again, I, I'm trying to, to get you to, to name one problem that is specific important to, to mathematics today. Well, I'll name uh, one problem that is specifically important for um, our understanding of the universe. And it's a mathematical problem. And uh, it's the problem of... Uh, proving the existence of a mathematical model of quantum field theory. So, um, at the level of uh, mathematical manipulations, which lead to results that can be confirmed by experiments, this contraption exists in physics. It's amazing that it gives predictable results given that mathematically is really a non-existence. What physicists do is they compute certain quantities using Feynman diagrams, but every mathematician who ever worked with Feynman diagrams knows that it's a divergent series. The radius of convergence is zero, so you can not say anything, at least yet, about the function that they represent, if they represent a function. So I think this is one of the most fundamental problem, uh, and it's not really a physical problem, because physicists formulated what is expected, what is needed from this theory. It's a mathematical problem with so many uncertain elements that it looks like a physical problem, but intrinsically it's a mathematical problem. But is it, it has been a problem that's been around for, for quite some time now. Is, will it also keep, uh, keep uh, imposing new mathematics in the future? It's been around for a while, and uh, our progress of understanding what really the problem is was evolving. And there were many more, uh, I mean, there are, there are very nice examples of models in quantum field theory which mathematically exist. They're actually defined as mathematical objects. But most interesting uh, models like the standard model, well, they still resist this challenge, and I think this is the most important problem. So if a, if a new PhD student came up to you and said, I, I want to do this, uh -huh. would, would you then advise him and to follow that direction or, or guide him? No, I would advise him first to gain the momentum on easy problems, because this is so formidable problem that I wouldn't wish to advise student to start on it. It's just too complicated. And lastly, the uh, Last thing I want to uh, ask you is, if you um, if you think about what math what mathematics is and and uh, what is then the most exciting thing about mathematics for you? Well, probably the most exciting thing is mis about mathematics for me personally is the following fact. If you look at what we learn about the universe, about the nature, there are absolutely no um, facts that can go beyond empirical knowledge. So, strictly speaking, in mathematical terms, uh, we cannot say anything for sure, because all our experiences in the past, we cannot predict the future on the basis of 1,000 Observations, we try to predict the future, but we know that we can fail any moment. Even in the most, I mean, strictly speaking, nobody can say that the Planck constant will not change its value tomorrow. Of course, we believe that it will not change its value. So mathematics here plays a very important role that sort of brings all this empirical knowledge together. And as much 
say maybe some of the scientists would prefer to have science without mathematics. It's impossible. So it's really a tool for knowledge. It's, uh, it's how we organize our intellectual understanding of the universe. And for me, this is probably the most exciting thing about mathematics. Thank you very much.